Sharia law. In Christianity, the central focus is on the Savior and on man's redemption through having faith in that Savior and his sacrifice for our sins. In Islam, the central focus is placed upon man's total and unqualified submission to the will of Allah. In Islam, all of life is seen as a unity, and every aspect of it comes under Allah's control. In the West, we separate church and state and compartmentalize our lives between the religious and the secular. But in Islam, this is seen as a false separation, and politics, business, and all the aspects of social life are supposed to be as much under the control and influence of Islam as the religious practices of the five pillars. Islamic law is called Sharia, which literally means the path leading to the watering place, and it is the center of all Muslim religion and society. Sharia law is the expression of Allah's command, and its rules and decrees are given to guide every aspect of a Muslim's conduct. The Development of Sharia Law The legal code of law and ethics known as Sharia slowly developed over the early centuries of Muslim history. After Muhammad died, the beginning of Islam's outward expansion began. With the Quran now complete and no one else who would arise as a prophet, where was the Muslim community to find guidance for the new circumstances it found itself in? The Quran sets out some basic standards of conduct, but the Quran is in no sense a comprehensive legal code. In the whole Quran, no more than 80 verses deal with strictly legal matters, and while these verses covered a number of topics and introduced some new rules, their general effect was simply to modify existing Arab law. During his lifetime, Muhammad had resolved legal problems as they came up by interpreting and expanding the general provisions of the Quran, and the same improvising activity was carried on after his death by the early caliphs. But with the foundation of the Umayyad dynasty in 661, governing from Damascus over a vast military empire, a legal development of much broader dimensions came into being. With the appointment of judges called Qadis to the various provinces and districts, an organized judicial system began. But with no clear guidance for these judges to go by in their new circumstances, many elements and institutions of the former Byzantine and Persian law soon were absorbed into Islamic legal practice. In the 700s, a number of scholars began to openly debate whether the Umayyad Empire was properly making and enforcing laws and rules according to Islam. The Abbasids who overthrew the Umayyad dynasty in the mid-700s received widespread popular support for their rebellion, in large part by promising to return to Islamic principles. After coming to power, the Abbasids began to support the development of schools of judicial thought to develop a legal code that would be in agreement with Islamic principles and that came to be known as Sharia law. The Sources of Sharia Law The first and most important source of law was, of course, the Quran. There were two main schools of thought that developed in the beginning. One more liberal felt that the Quran was authoritative, but that when it came to matters outside of the Quran, people could use their own human reasoning to decide what should be binding or not. The other, more traditional group felt that following human reasoning was too dangerous, and said that Sharia law could only be established through following the Quran and the Sunnah, or the example of Muhammad's life, as revealed in the traditions of his words and acts known as the Hadith. The second group dominated, and as a result, a great effort began to collect and classify these traditions of Muhammad's words and actions. The word hadith means a report. From early on, Muhammad had been viewed as the ideal for a Muslim to follow, and the Quran itself even says in Surah 3321, Verily in the Messenger of Allah you have a good example. During his lifetime, writing down his sayings and acts was discouraged by Muhammad, lest they be confused with the Quran, but his disapproval of the practice shows that it existed. After his death, many more hadith or stories about him were written and circulated. Many were unauthentic, and as the hadith grew in importance for the Muslims, many were written just to prove a point or to establish the position of this or that group. A science of hadith came into being to sort through the hundreds of thousands of stories eventually written within the first 200 years after Muhammad to establish which ones were authentic and which were not. The methodology used was to follow the chain of links of people reporting the hadith. For example, a hadith may start, 
Al-Hakim reported from Muhammad ibn Musab, who informed us that al ozai on the authority of Shadad Abu Amar, on the authority of Umm al-Fadl bint al-Harith, said, and then would come the story. If the links of the people reporting in the chain were seen to be trustworthy people, and the people involved in the links were known to have been in such a place at such a time, so that the story could be true, then it was accepted as authentic. The major emphasis on accepting a hadith as authentic was the reliability of the chain of people listed and not, was this the sort of thing Muhammad might be imagined to have said or done. The earliest hadith written close to the lifetime of Muhammad normally didn't worry much about who the chain of reporters were, so there is good reason to suspect that many of the hadith with the most articulate and well-defined links are actually unauthentic. It is clear that many customs found their way into Islam in the form of alleged traditions of Muhammad that were just fabricated. In the mid-800s, the six major collections of hadith which are accepted as authentic were compiled, and the canon was closed. For Muslims, the hadith are second only to the Quran in authority, and they hold the equivalence for them that the Gospels do for Christians. The thousands of hadith cover nearly every imaginable topic from the disposal of a date seed to the description of the Day of Judgment. Here are a few examples of hadith. The climate of Medina did not suit some people, so the Prophet ordered them to follow his shepherd, that is, his camels, and to drink their milk and urine as medicine. So they followed the shepherd, that is, the camels, and drank their milk and urine till their bodies became healthy. Then they killed the shepherd and drove away the camels. When the news reached the Prophet, he sent some people in their pursuit. When they were brought, he cut off their hands and feet, and their eyes were branded with hot pieces of iron, and they were left away in Hara till they died in that state of theirs. Anas bin Malik said, The Prophet used to visit all his wives in around during the day and night, and they were eleven in number. I asked Anas, Had the Prophet the strength for it? Anas replied, We used to say that the Prophet was given the strength of thirty men. Allah's apostle passed by two graves, and he heard the voices of two persons who were being tortured in their graves. The Prophet said, These are not being tortured for a major sin. One of them used to not save himself from being soiled with his own urine, and the other used to go about gossiping. The Prophet then asked for a green leaf of a date palm tree, split it into two pieces, and planted one on each grave and said, May their torture be lessened till these two pieces of leaf are dried. Allah's apostle said, if a husband calls his wife to his bed, that is to have sexual relations, and she refuses and causes him to sleep in anger, the angels will curse her till morning. Allah's apostle said, The prayer of a person who does hadath is not accepted till he repeats the ablution. A person from Hadaramut asked Abu Huraira, What is hadath? Abu Huraira replied, Hadath means the passing of wind from the anus. Once Allah's apostle went out to offer the prayer of Eid al -Adha. Then he passed by the women and said, O women, give alms, as I have seen that the majority of the dwellers of hellfire were you women. They asked, Why is it so, O Allah's apostle? He replied, You curse frequently and are ungrateful to your husbands. I have not seen anyone more deficient in intelligence and religion than you. A cautious, sensible man could be led astray by some of you. The women asked, O Allah's apostle, what is deficient in our intelligence and religion? He said, Is not the evidence of two women equal to the witness of one man? They replied in the affirmative. He said, This is the deficiency in her intelligence. Isn't it true that a woman can neither pray nor fast during her monthly periods? The women replied in the affirmative. He said, This is the deficiency in her religion. The Prophet said, If any of you rouses from sleep and performs the ablution, he should wash his nose by putting water in it and then blowing it out three times because Satan has stayed in the upper part of his nose all the night. Allah's apostle said, He who eats seven ajwa dates every morning will not be affected by poison or magic on the day he eats them. A missionary writing about the hadith said, The prophet is caught, as it were, in the ordinary acts of his life, sleeping, eating, mating, praying, dispensing justice, planning expeditions, and revenge against his enemies. The picture that emerges is hardly flattering, and one is left wondering why in the world it was reported at all, and whether it was done by his friends or his enemies. One is also left to wonder how the believers, generation after generation, could have found these stories so inspiring. The answer is that believers are conditioned to look at the whole thing through the eyes of faith. 
an infidel in his fundamental misguidance may find the prophet rather sensual and cruel, and certainly many of the things he did do not conform to ordinary ideas of morality, but the believers look at the whole thing differently. To them, morality derives from the prophet's actions. The moral is whatever he did. Morality does not determine the prophet's actions, but his actions determine and define morality. Muhammad's acts were not ordinary acts, they were Allah's own acts. It was in this way and by this logic that Muhammad's opinions became the dogmas of Islam and his personal habits and idiosyncrasies became moral imperatives, Allah's command for all believers in all ages and climes to follow. Because Muhammad used to put his right shoe on before he put his left one on, a good Muslim today should do the same. As Sharia law was being debated and formulating under the Abbasids, four schools of legal thought developed. The strictest, called Hanbali after its founder, said that the Quran and Hadith were the only guides for a Muslim to follow. But other schools of thought took a broader view and said that when the Quran and the Hadith did not give clear guidance on a matter, then Muslim law could be decided using two other sources. They said the third source for Sharia law was ijma, or consensus, meaning the accepted consensus of opinions of Islamic judges and scholars on a given matter, and this was based upon belief in hadith, which say that the majority Muslim community will never be led astray. The period of the 800s are generally seen as the last period in which authoritative consensus was established, and so ijma has come to be seen as a source of rigidity in judicial thinking. The accepted interpretations of the Quran and Hadith all rest finally on the ijma or consensus of scholars from then. The last source of guidance and laws for those times when even the Quran, Hadith, and consensus were not sufficient to give clear guidance was kios or analogy, which was arrived at by looking at the intention of some rule in the Quran or Hadith. An example of using kios or analogy would be in forbidding the use of intoxicating drugs in modern times based on the grounds that the Quran forbids drinking wine, which is also intoxicating. A couple examples of traditional Sharia law are the hand of a thief is to be cut off as punishment for his crime, and in a trial of murder, a woman's testimony is worth only half the legal value of a man's.